afternoon, good evening, wherever you're joining us from. We're so glad that you could join us. We're in the middle of a series called Vaccinate Your Money. And we're hearing so many testimonies of what God is doing in our lives. And this morning is just about to do even greater things. Well, we're going to go forth and do some songs in, in praise and honor to our God. So feel free to join in and let us praise God like never before for the glory and honor of His name. Come on, Kathy, are you ready? Yeah. All right, let's go.
of all the praise, one thing that we have learned through this season is that everything belongs to God and we can never claim that we own anything for ourselves. And so this morning we've gathered to proclaim that He is our cornerstone, that we put our trust in Him. All things, that the everything that concerns us shall be perfected by Him for the glory and honor of His name. Come on, just join us one more time and let's worship God with this song. This song says that God is our cornerstone. Thank you, Jesus. We worship you, Lord. We give you all the praise, Jesus. There's no other God like you. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but holy trust in Jesus' name. Let's sing that in Swahili. Sina. Oh, Sina. Ila damu yake Yesu. Ila damu yake Yesu. Sina wema wakutosha. Sina wema wakutosha. Dhambi zangu kuziosha.
Because we still have so much lined up for you. Today, Pastor is coming loaded. And you better be ready. Get out your notebook and your pen and take some notes because these are lessons that will, let, will help you 10, 20, 30, 40 years from now. So get ready for a mighty move of God, even through Pastor word. In the name of Jesus Christ, we have worshipped him. Everybody say, Amen. 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 Hey, greetings. My name is Pastor M. It's such a joy to see every one of you in God's house today, wherever you're watching from, whether you're home or somewhere else. Uh, we're so, so glad you could join us. And uh, what a delightful time of worship. It's always fun every Sunday to come into God's presence and just worship Him with everything we have. Uh, but in addition to that, we get to listen to His Word and be built up. I'm really looking forward to bringing God's Word today as we're going to be concluding uh, the series that we've been going through uh, called Vaccinate Your Money. And I just believe, uh, boy, I've got, to, I've got to find my bones uh, to bring this Word to you today. And I'm looking forward to it. Uh, but also just uh, to mention a couple of things that are happening this week. Uh, uh, every week uh, on, on Wednesday... Uh, at 5.30, we have what we call our family night. And if you've uh, been part of this, this is just a time for the family. If you consider yourself a part of the Mavuno family, you just love to be part of understanding what God is doing in this season in the family. It's a place of discipleship, a place of teaching. And so 5.30, uh, you can tune in to our, our Facebook page or our YouTube page, and you'll be able to just connect as part of this family. Uh, but now I just want to talk a bit about, uh, as, as we give uh, towards God's work, uh, and this congregation has just been a generous giving congregation all these, all these years. I want to just uh, share a thought that really encourages me whenever I think about giving. And um, it's actually a thought that a friend shared with me and uh, was, was such a good thought. Uh, and he talked to me about the fact that, you know, whenever we give God, uh, whenever God challenges us to give, uh, he always has a plan for our provision. And uh, I, was, I, was, I was reading the, the story in 1 Kings uh, chapter 17. And God has a provision for his prophet Elijah. And he sends him to a widow's house. And he says, when you get to the widow's house, I've instructed, she will provide for you. And so Elijah, I don't know what he's thinking in his mind. He's probably thinking this is a very wealthy widow uh, that God has set aside to provide for me in this time of drought as I'm hiding from, from a king who wants to kill him. And he gets there and he finds that this widow is collecting sticks uh, so that she can start a fire and make her last piece of bread uh, for her and her son so they can eat it and die. And it's like, why would God ask this person to be the one to feed the prophet? And of course, she tell, when, when, she, when, when Elijah asks her, he says, well, I'd love to help you, but this is all we have. And Elijah challenges her, says, listen, just go do it. Make me the bread that I've asked for, and you will see what God will do. And this woman, uh, to her credit, she goes and she, she feeds the prophet. And the Bible says that God multiplied the fly in her house. 
And if you read in, in uh, 1 Kings 17, 11, it says, from verse 16, For the jar of flour was not used up, and the jug of oil did not run dry, in keeping with the word of the Lord spoken by Elijah. My goodness. When you do God's business, when you take care of God's business, God takes care of your business. And I think that's one thing I've learned to be true in my own life and one of the reasons that I give. And so I want to encourage us as we give this, uh, this morning to give generously. And my goodness, I'm so excited to just pray for you as you do that because I believe some of you are not going to be giving because you have plenty. You're giving out of just your faith in God. And my prayer is that just like the widow found God to be faithful, you too will find God to be faithful in your life. So let's pray as we prepare for God's word. My Father, I just want to thank you for this family. I thank you for everybody watching this message, whatever TV station they're watching it from, uh, whatever, whether they're watching it on the internet, uh, whether they're in church, uh, watching it in a, in a physical building. Uh, Father, I pray for every single one of us. Uh, I know that, Lord, we are ordained to be here. None of us is here by coincidence. And Father, even as we worship you with our, with our substance, with our tithes and with our offerings, I pray that, Lord, you would, you would uh, just be gracious to your people. I pray for everybody who's struggling right now, who's, who's looking for a job, longing uh, to be able to provide through a job. Uh, for people right now who are struggling, praying for their business because there's not been a breakthrough in their business. I pray that, Father God, we would find you, like the widow did, to be faithful. As we look after your business, Lord, we pray that you would look after our business. And Father, I just commit us to you now. I pray that, Lord, you'd give us even a greater hunger for your word. Help us to understand what you have for us. I, I thank you for the word that is coming to us today. And I pray that, Lord, every single one of us would receive it as your word and that we will be transformed and changed and we will never be the same. And so we honor you and we thank you and we praise you with expectation. For we pray all these things in the much, mighty and matchless name of our Lord and Savior Jesus. God's people say it. Amen. Amen. Greetings, Mavuno Church. Welcome to church. We're so glad you're here. Uh, wherever you're sitting in the living room, if you're in the kitchen getting your coffee, come quickly. Uh, don't miss church today. It's going to be a fantastic, fantastic word. I'm so, so excited to be bringing it to you. I'm here at Mavuno, preaching this at Mavuno Hill City uh, with a live audience. Uh, I'm so excited to have these guys with me in church. Uh, many of you are watching from home and you're watching from different parts of the world. Some are watching from Kenya. Some are watching from Uganda. Others are watching in other countries. We're so glad you're here. And this is going to be a it's going to be just a fun, fun Sunday together. And we've been going through for our visitors. We're happy you're here. You're in the right place. Uh, these, these crazy people, uh, we love you. We're so happy you're here. And we're going through a series called Vaccinate Your Money. <laughs> so so we, what we say is, you know, the disease of money is not a physical disease. It's a spiritual disease. And so when you vaccinate your money, what are you doing? You're breaking curses over your money. And we've been looking at curses that we need to break over our money. We've talked about the curse of indebtedness. And how we need to just break debt. Debt is not your portion in Christ Jesus. Somebody say amen. amen. That's not what God has for you. We talked about the fact that there's a debt of consumerism that has swept across the world. And many of us are part of it. But we say that's not God's plan for us. And we began to talk about how to break the curse of consumerism. And then last week, we talked about the curse of stagnation. And we say that stagnation is when you're just stuck. You have potential, but you can't move forward uh, financially. And then we looked in the scripture and we learned how to break the curse of stagnation. Oh my goodness, God's desire is that this will be a church that is debt-free, that is living simply, that is multiplying resources, and that will be able to do the things that God is calling us to do. And I know that your family is one of the ones that God has allowed to listen to this message in this season uh, for freedom. Because the word says, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. So somebody in the house is going to receive freedom today as we receive God's word. Amen. So today we want to talk about the fourth curse that has limited the finances of many in Africa and across the world. And this is the curse of the devourer. The curse of the devourer. What is the curse of the devourer? I want you to turn with me in the scriptures to a very familiar passage. Uh, this is a passage that you've probably had read before. Uh, you've, you've maybe had it in church before. Uh, it's Malachi chapter 3. And, and as you turn there, let me just say something about the book of Malachi. Malachi is the last book of the Old Testament. So if you ever lost, just go to Matthew, uh, Mark, Luke, and John, and then just go the book before. And that's Malachi. It was written by the prophet 
Duh, Malachi, <laughs> and, and he probably lived around the same time as Nehemiah uh, when they were building the wall of Jerusalem. That's the time that uh, Malachi was prophesying. And God's people had been taken captives before that. Uh, for 70 years, they had lived in colonialism. They had been oppressed uh, uh, in Babylon. And then they were allowed by King Cyrus to return back to their land. That whole story uh, is a historical story. It's in the scripture as well recorded. And after coming back to the land, they had lived 100 years in the land, and they had managed to rebuild the temple, uh, but somehow after that first uh, big energy, their energy had died down for the things of God. And they found themselves without energy for God. They found themselves turning, becoming unfaithful to God just like their ancestors had been. They found themselves becoming a corrupt people. Their priesthood was corrupt. The people were corrupt. There was a spiritual lethargy across the whole land. And Malachi's message comes to a people in that situation. And he's telling them that God still loves you guys. God hasn't given up on you. But the problems you're facing in your life right now are because of your unfaithfulness to God's law. And that you're going to find through the book of Malachi, he's, talking, he's pointing out the different things, the wrong choices that they've been making that have been bringing problems to themselves. Because these guys were complaining and saying, we have so many problems, God has abandoned us. And Malachi is saying, God loves you still, but there's some things you're doing that are causing problems for yourselves. And one of the things he points out is Malachi chapter 3, verse 6. And I'm going to start reading from verse 6. And here's what it says. I, the Lord, do not change. So you, O descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. Ever since the time of your forefathers, you've turned away from my decrees and you've not kept them. Return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. But you ask, how are we to return? Will a man rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how do we rob you? In tithes and offerings. You are under a curse, the whole nation of you, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have enough room for it. I will prevent pests from destroying your crops, and the vines in your fields will not cast their fruit, says the Lord Almighty. Then all the nations will call you blessed, for yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord Almighty. Now the context of this passage is a conversation between God and his people. God is challenging them to come back to him, to return back to him. And, and they ask, how are we supposed to return to you, God? How do you want us to do that? What is it that you're expecting of us? And God says, well, the first thing you can do is stop stealing from me. <laughs> and the guys are like, what? Like stealing from God? How do you steal from God? You're in heaven, man. How do we steal from you? And God says, let me tell you what I'm talking about. I'm talking about your tithes and your offerings. Now, it's interesting because a tithe basically means a tenth of income. It was a tenth of their income. Every year, the Israelites were supposed to put aside a tenth. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. One part of their income was put aside for God's work. And what would happen is every year they would bring, they would collect this. Uh, when, when this law was given, when they moved into the land, they would collect all this uh, tenth and they would take it to the place where God's te uh, tent was, the place of worship, and they would eat it there with their families and with the Levites, the people who worked in God's house. And then every third year, they were not to take it to the place of meeting. They were to keep the entire tithe locally for the care of the Levites in their region. And the tithe was extremely important. Why? Because of several reasons. I think there were at least five things that the tithe symbolized. The first, it was an act of obedience. An act of obedience. Leviticus chapter 27 verse 30. Uh, God had commanded them. He said, a tithe of everything in the land, <laughs> whether grain from the soil or fruit from the trees, it belongs to the Lord. It is holy to the Lord. You know, the Israelites understood that God required them to tithe. It was actually a command. God, who had given them all things, wanted them to give back 10% of their income to him. And why? Because he said, this part is holy. Holy means it is set apart. In other words, it's not yours. <laughs> I've given you everything. It was all mine and I gave it all to you. But out of everything I give you, 10% is not yours. It is holy. It is set apart from me. And the Israelites understood that not giving tithe to God actually meant they were taking what belonged to God. That's why they were being called robbers in this passage. In fact, when you read through the scripture, you're not going to find that the Israelites were supposed to give a tithe. There's, there's no giving of a tithe. They paid their tithe. 
For the Israelites, it was something you paid. So when you got your money, there was nothing. You know, sometimes we say God loves a cheerful giver. We confuse that. And we think that God wants you to be cheerful when you're tithing. There's nothing about that. They actually paid. It was like a tax. They paid it. And you know what? Uh, the offerings were voluntary because he said your tithes and offerings. Vol tithe offerings were voluntary. They could be given for different purposes depending on how you felt led. But with the tithe, it was, not a, it was a requirement. So for them, it was an act of obedience. God expected them to obey. But number two, it was an act of worship. By tithing, the Israelites were demonstrating their honor to God. And they were showing that he was to be the giver, that he was the giver, and that their worship was to the giver, not to the gift. You know, sometimes you can get that twisted. God gives us gifts, we start worshiping the gifts. We start being held by the gifts. Yeah. And if you read the, the book of Proverbs, it says a very interesting thing. It says, honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. That's Proverbs 3, verse 9 to 10. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing, and your vats will brim over with new wine. Honor. You honor the Lord. This is how they worship God. They honor God by giving him the fast fruits of everything they produced. You know, the tithe was not after they have eaten, whatever is left over, they brought it to God. Their surplus, their leftovers. No, no, no. Through the tithe, they were supposed to pick the first, the best, the first part of it. This is what they brought to God's house. And through the tithe, what the Israelites were declaring is, my goodness, everything I have belongs to God, and I give my best back to him. They were declaring that their dependence was on God not on, on, on what God had given them. An act of obedience, an act of worship. Number three, it was an act of identification. So what happens when an Israelite tithed is that they were actually declaring they were part of God's covenant people. So when I tithe, basically what I'm saying to God is I belong to you. It's the same as when you pay taxes. If you are a Ugandan, you don't pay your taxes in Kenya. <laughs> There's a reason why you don't do that. It's because you belong in Uganda. And that's the same way. When you come with your tax, and, and when you pay your taxes, it's a, it's a way of saying, I'm a citizen. I have responsibility here. This is what I do. It's, a, it's an act of belonging. It's actually one of the ways that you demonstrate your citizenship as a person. With their tithes, the Israelites were declaring that their citizenship was in God's kingdom. Deuteronomy chapter, 17, chapter 8, verse 17 to 18. Very interesting. It says, you may say to yourself, my power and my strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me. And I think I've read this scripture almost every Sunday. But remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth and so confirms his covenant, which he swore to your ancestors as it is today. You see, it's so easy that after God has blessed you and you've been praying for God's blessing and you've been, you've been, you've been so like, God, I just need you to come through. And then God comes through and then you immediately forget how desperate you are when you're praying. Anybody feeling me in the house? Yeah. It's like I, I, I prayed, I really needed God to come through. And then when he came through and I got my scholarship and oh my goodness, look at how smart I am. Man, those grades and the way I used to, they, they, in fact, even the way we describe it, the way I used to pray, man, this thing had to happen. <laughs> it wasn't you who prayed, it was God who had mercy on you. And we forget that God is so merciful, we forget that actually God is the one who did it. God says, remember the Lord your God. Don't forget where you come from. Don't forget who you are. And when you tithe, you're identifying. You're saying, everything I have, everything I, I, I own, everything comes from him, and I belong to him. Lord, I'm part of your covenant people. My tithing is a sense of identification. Number four, tithing was an act of thanksgiving. You see, for the Israelites, failing to pay tithes was being ungrateful. It was failure to say thank, thank you. And God did not take that well. When they tithe, they were acknowledging, my goodness, God, Look at how amazing you are. Let me give part of this back to your work. In Hosea chapter 2, verse 8 to 9, you're going to see God actually complaining because of this guy's forgetfulness. Uh, Hosea 2, verse 8 to 9, God says, she's not acknowledged. She's talking about Israel. She has not acknowledged that I was the one who gave her the grain, the new wine, and the oil, and who lavished on her the silver and the gold, which they used for Baal. So first of all, I'm the one who gave it to you. Now you're using it for your own things. And then he says, therefore, I will take away my grain when it ripens and my new wine when it is ready. I will, get, I will take my wool and my linen intended to cover her naked body. It's like, whoa, hold on. It's like God is saying, listen, I've been so gracious to you, Israel, but you've completely forgotten. You've completely not given thanks to me. And because of that, I'm going to strip everything back away from you. You know, everybody, I mean, even a father loves to bless. Every father loves to bless his children. Every father loves it when... You give gifts to your children. But when your kids start acting like they don't care, 
like they start getting a sense of entitlement. They start feeling like you, that you don't even matter. They start feeling like, my goodness, what, what are you even doing here? As a father, your heart grows cold. And, and God's heart was just like, man, I'm going to take back the blessings I gave you because I want you to understand where they came from. So, so tithing was an act of thankfulness. It's saying, God, everything I have comes from you. I'm so thankful. And I'm declaring my thanks with the resource I have. And then number five, I said there are at least five things. The, first, the fifth is an act of responsibility. With their tithes, what the Israelites were doing is that they were saying, I am playing a part as a member of this family. Like, 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 when you have, like, like one of the things we tell our kids, by the way, is in our house, when you do your, your chores, <laughs> don't expect to be paid for doing your chores. That's what we all do. We're, a mem we're members of one family. And being part of the family has privileges, but it also has responsibility. And so every one of us, we pull together for the sake of the family. And that their ties were the way that they supported God's work on earth. Now, God didn't want them to get it twisted. He didn't need their money. By the way, when I, when, when I get my kids to wash the dishes, I don't do it because I can't afford to get someone else to wash the dishes. But I do it because, hey, I want you to carry your responsibility as part of the family. And God reminded the Israelites the same way. He told them in Psalm chapter 50, verse 9 to 12, he said, I have no need of a bull from your stall <laughs> or goats from your pens. For every animal in the forest is mine, <laughs> and the cattle on a thousand hills. I know every bird in the mountains, and the insects in the field are mine. If I was hungry, I would not tell you, for the world is mine, and all in it. <laughs> it's like God is saying, listen, listen, guys, don't get it twisted. Just because I'm asking you to tithe, don't think I need it. I can do it without you. I'm giving you the privilege of belonging. This is your responsibility for my house. I'm calling you as a, child, as a child, as a son, as a daughter to contribute to the work of this family. And I'm dignifying you by doing that. If you read Deuteronomy chapter 26, verse 12, Moses taught the Israelites. He says, when you finish setting aside a tenth of your produce in the third year, in the year of the tithe, you will give it to the Levite, to the foreigner, to the fatherless, and to the widow, so they may eat in your towns and be satisfied. In other words, your tithes, are supposed to do God's work. It's like God is extending himself through you to bless those who work full-time in his house, to bless the poor and the needy around you. And this is your privilege as the people of Israel. Now, here's the interesting thing about the Israel, the, this passage, Malachi chapter 3, that God is saying that they placed themselves under a curse. He says it so strongly. He says you are under a curse, the whole nation of you. This is the only place that, that God then says, he says something very interesting. First of all, he says, you're the ones who've put yourselves in that curse. But then he says something that you never see anywhere else in scripture. God says, test me in this. You know, in the rest of scripture, you're going to find things like, do not put the Lord your God to the test. So, 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 so it's like crazy. It's like God is saying, hold on, hold on. For this one, for this one, test me. Like, I, I dare you. Just test me and you will see what I'm capable of. It's like God says, test me by tithing and you will see how I'll open the floodgates of heaven. You'll be so inundated with blessing, you will not be able to contain it. And he says, I will keep pests from destroying your crops. Test me. Now, I've written quite a bit about tithes before. Uh, like I said, the books, Financial Fitness, Financial Foundation, they talk about, uh, and it explains, by the way, that the tithe was ne will never make you rich. Tithing by itself, there's a, there's a section where I talk about the fact that tithing doesn't make you rich. Uh, God doesn't promise to make you rich when you, tithe, when you tithe. What he says is two things. Number one, when you tithe, he will open the floodgates of heaven. That's what he says in this passage. I will open the floodgates of heaven. Remember, he's talking to farmers. And opening the floodgates of heaven means that it will rain. That's what floodgates, flood, just take it literally, it will rain. Let me tell you this, only a farmer who has planted crops rejoices when it rains. Because yeah, anybody else is thinking my shoes will get muddy, my clothes will get messed, I won't be able to enjoy going to the office. So if, you don't, if you're not a farmer, if you, if you don't have any crops, then you're going to be complaining about the rain. So God is saying, listen, I will accelerate your investments. If you have investments in the ground, you will rejoice. So listen, if you don't have investments, we talked about investments last week. If you don't have investments and you're tithing, then God has nothing to accelerate. So even if you have a million times blessing, a million times zero is zero. Yeah, so some of you are tithing, you've been tithing faithfully, but because you're not an investor, then the floodgates are coming and they're inconveniencing you. All right, maybe I should be nice. <laughs> Listen to me, this is, this is actually life, right? And I believe it works because I've experienced it in my life. So listen, God is saying, I will accelerate 
investment. God wants us all to be investors. But number two, he says, the second promise, he says, I will remove the pests from devouring your crops. Again, you have to have crops for you to be worried about pests. So again, the investor is, is, is afraid of pests. Why? Because pests come to destroy. In fact, if you read in the King James, it says, I will rebuke the devourer on your behalf. Who is a devourer? The devourer is the one who came and brought senseless loss. You've planted your maize and you come and find it full of holes because pests have come. The devourer has come and destroyed your maize. For the Israelites, that was a pest. But in modern days, the devourer is the senseless loss that comes on your investments. It's a thing that happens when there's wastage or carelessness, or neglect, or fire, or accidents, or riots, or stealing. You've invested in something and then boom, something happens and it's like your investment is wasted. You lose what you've invested. Your hard work should have led to prosperity, but instead your hard work led to scarcity. Your, your earnings were scattered and they did not benefit you. Now, what God is saying is that, and what I think I learned from this passage, by the way, this was really mind-blowing for me. What I learned is, when you don't tithe, you still tithe. What do I mean by that? It means that month when you just negotiate and you say, um, you know what, <laughs> this month things are not going well. I think I'll just pause. I'll use my tithe for something else. Next month, we'll sort out things. That's a month when the devourer comes into your house. And you know how the devourer operates? That's a month when you've just entered with your new suit into the matatu and you sit and as you stand up, there's a nail in the seat and you just hear, <laughs> and your suit, <laughs> guess what you've just done? You've tithed to the devourer. Or when you're backing up your car from the garage and you just hear, and there's a nail on the door and it's just messed your paintwork and guess what it's going to cost you? You've just tithed to the devourer. Many of us are good friends with the devourer. He's like he's a constant companion in your house. And this passage is teaching us, here's what happens with this curse. Let me tell you, this curse of the devourer is so powerful. I used to be friends with the devourer. I'm not a friend with the devourer anymore. I began to understand that when it comes to curses, and I think we've been teaching this, this almost this whole year. We've been talking about family curses. That's why we did Simama, and we talked about many th ways that we deal and break with curses. And we said that God gives us authority to, take, to break curses because of the power of his Holy Spirit within us. In fact, I've taught you, not, you don't even need to come to a, a pastor to break the curses in your family. Just take your family through renunciation and through prayer, and you will see curses breaking. But when it comes to the devourer, this is the one curse that God says does not break by you binding it. It does not go away by you chasing it. He says, I will rebuke the devourer on your behalf. I think this is such a powerful curse, this devourer. It needs God himself to speak on your behalf. So what happens is when you tithe, you're closing the door to your devourer. You're shutting it out. And then you have the authority to stand up and to say, because God, I have tithed. <laughs> Please rebuke the devourer. You know, that was such a powerful thing because I always thought I'm the one who rebukes the devourer. James chapter 4 verse 7, he says, submit yourself to God, resist the devil and he will flee from you. And so I've always practiced that. But I came to understand that the only way to chase the devourer away is that when I tithe, God rebukes the devourer on my behalf. I'll give you an example of something that happened uh, recently during the time of prayer, during our time of prayer and fasting. And I, there were some things that were happening in our home and things were breaking. Do you ever go through those seasons? Like something broke, then something, somebody drove a car and hit uh, something in the house, um, something in our garage, and he just bent it, and, so, and everything was just costing me. And I remember that time, I was so confused. I kept telling my wife, I don't understand what's going on. And I was praying and asking God, God, show me what to do. And it's very interesting. This was a personal experience. God, God show me what to do. And God led me. He, he actually spoke to me very clearly as I was praying. And he said, Marathi, you give. You give. You and your, your wife, you're faithful in giving. But the giving that you're giving, you haven't called it a tithe. And I remember just thinking, oh my goodness, we actually give considerably. Um, we, we, we give considerably. Our pride, by the way, Mavuno, is that we're, we're among the top givers in Mavuno Church. And we have always been ever since this church began. And I don't say that with pride. I say it with humility. But it was interesting. God said, call it what it is. So I talked to my wife and I said to her, sweetie, uh, we've been giving. But we need to start calling this giving. When we bring it to church, we need to actually declare that this is our tithe and pray in thanksgiving and say, God, we've given our tithe. And we began to do that. And almost instantly, I began to see things shift. It's like things began to happen. Some of the lost things began to be found. <laughs> it's like all of a sudden, I just felt like authority came. And I prayed and I told God, God, because of, on the basis of this, rebuke the devourer on our behalf. And I can tell you, I'm not a, I'm not a friend with the devourer anymore. It's, it's, it's something that it's even hard to explain. 
But right now, I can tell you I'm walking in authority. And there's no devourer in my house. Uh, there's no devourer over my children. There's some incredible miracles that have happened. I wish I had time to go into all that. But all I want to tell you is this. The devourer is a special kind of curse. You need God himself to rebuke on your behalf. And he says, listen, test me, test me, test me. You're under a curse, but test me. And if you will not tithe, and, and, and I will open the floodgates of heaven, I'll accelerate you. But I will also rebuke the devourer on your behalf. Now, some people say that tithe is an Old Testament law and that there's nothing in the New Testament about the tithe. It's not binding on Christians, that we're no longer under the law. And, and, and here's what I say. I say, you're correct. You're actually correct. The New Testament does not require us to give 10% of our income to God's work. Instead, the New Testament tells us to give generously to God's work. Uh, let me read one scripture. And by the way, I'm, I'm drawing to an end, but I just wanted to put this objection because I suspect somebody might raise it. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6 to 11. Uh, and it says this, 2 Corinthians 9, 6 to 11. This is Paul speaking to the church in Corinth. He says this, Remember, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And then he says, verse 8, and God is able to bless you abundantly, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. Then he says in verse 10, Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanks to God. By the way, that's a completely different level of giving. Eh? Because he's saying God will enrich you in every way. And he says in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. He's not saying in 10% of your things, with 10% of your resources. He, he's actually, the New Testament is at a different level. Why is that? Because as we move from living under the law, we move into the land of grace under Jesus. And the more we move, as we move into that space, we move from move, serving God out of duty and we start serving him out of love, out of delight, as a response to his grace. He's been so amazing. He saved me. I have nothing without him. Without Jesus, I'd be, I'd be dead. And out of that, I realized that as a Jesus follower, I don't give because I'm expected to give. I'm a lot more generous than that. I give because I'm a recipient of his salvation. I'm, I give because of the great gift that Jesus has given me that people in the Old Testament could only have wished for. And so because of that, I'm much more generous. And Paul is saying this. He's saying, listen, listen, listen. Here's what the gospel does when it enters your heart and just grabs you. <laughs> Here's what the gospel does. You stop thinking of giving in terms of your excess and you start longing for the privilege to be part of God's family and to play your part in that family. It's a different ball game. You love God so much because of his love and generosity to you that you want to do whatever it takes to be part of what he is doing. You stop defining life in terms of what you own. And you start defining life in, in, in terms of who owns you. And that's Jesus. It's like, God, everything I have is yours. Show me what to do with it. Show me how to serve you with it. It's not 10% anymore. It's 100% of my life. I give myself. Paul says, I put my body on the altar as a living sacrifice. Everything I have belongs to God. So I say to you, if you say tithing is Old Testament, I say that is so true. It is so true because in the New Testament, it's everything. But listen, I believe that tithing, in many ways, it's entry level. It's training. I believe just like the Old Testament trained us for the New Testament, tithing trains us for a life of sacrificial giving to God. It's an entrance into the life of grace. And those of the people, those of, if, if those of the, under the law could give 10% out of obedience, out of thankfulness, out of dependence, out of identification, the things we've talked about. How about us who've been saved by God's grace? The more God captures our heart, the more we'll stop asking, how much do I have to give again? And you get to those questions Christians ask, do I tithe my net or do I tithe my gross or what? You, we stop asking those questions and we start asking, how, how can I give more? How can I be more generous to God's work? How can I serve more passionately? How can I love more sacrificially to the glory of the one who loved me and who gave everything for me? Hey, this reckless love of God, this is what we celebrate every time we come to give. 
And so at Mavuno, I want to say this, and today I'm talking about giving. I've talked about a lot. I've talked about saving. I've talked about getting out of debt. I've talked about investing. Today I'm talking about giving. And I'm saying that over the years in this church, we've supported the work of ministry through the tithes of God's people. <laughs> and we've achieved amazing things as a church because this is a generous congregation. Mavuno is a generous congregation. If you're new in this church, I need to let you know this, that we are a generous people. And I remember when we were just three years old as a church with very young people in that church, many, many students and many people in their first jobs, that we had to raise 30 million shillings. Uh, that was like, what's that in dollars? It's like a lot of money. <laughs> and we had to move to a new venue uh, where we could reach more people with the gospel. And I remember at that point that the congregation just rallied behind. And through the tithes of God's people and the sacrificial offerings that they gave, we were able to actually move into that space. But in addition to that, we've started planting churches across the world. We've been able to plant 10, uh, churches in 10 different countries, including in Berlin, uh, in Europe. And all because of the, the families in this church who've, who've, who've given their lives to Jesus, who've, who've given their resources to the work of God. Our families have been saved. Marriages and families have been changed. To God be the glory for the, for the generous giving of this church. And I want to just say as I pray, as I conclude, my goodness, the best is still to come. I believe that God is calling us to much higher levels of, of walking with Him. I believe God is calling us even to be greater stewards than we've ever been in the past. Uh, and you know what? I believe that God is calling us as we apply the lessons of this whole series uh, to a level of prosperity that we've never experienced. It's not going to be the, 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 the prosperity of hustling. It's going to be the prosperity of trusting in God, waiting on the Lord and being renewed and seeing resources abound in every good work that we have, that God has for us. But I want you to remember that in this season, God has given us challenges. And I want to end with the fourth challenge. But let me just say this. Some of you, your prayer today needs to be a confession prayer because as I preach, God has convicted you. You've been robbing Him. You've been robbing Him. You're not even at the basics of the Old Testament. You're not even giving your tithe to the church that you go to. Some of you, you have a different church you attend. You're just visiting today. You need to be a tither in your church. If that's a place that you're being built and you're being grown every week, then that's a place you need to give your tithe. If you're a part of Mavuno family, and maybe this is you as well, you need to be saying, God, forgive me. I've been a robber and I will be a robber no more. But I want to just uh, leave you with a fourth challenge. Let me remind you the four challenges. The first challenge, we will be out of debt by next year. Amen. Amen. Every single one of us. This is God's plan for us. By this time next year, we will be out of debt. Amen. And it's not going to be just by wishing it. We're going to start the hard work of oh, getting out of debt. Yes. Number two that all of us will be saving at least 20% of our income. Yes. Putting it aside every month, 20%, trusting God to help us. Uh, our challenge number three is all of us will have saved at least three months expenses by this time next year. And I know that's what we call our emergency fund. And I know that many of you, this is going to be liberating. As you save that, this is going to be liberating. You're going to be walking next year with no fear, no worries, no thoughts about resource because you will see God providing as you multiply his resources. And the fourth challenge, my last challenge uh, for this series, challenge number four, is that you will commit to never rob God. Ah, robbing and you are not in fellowship. That is not your portion in Christ Jesus. Yes. That you will commit to tithe and to give at least 10% to the work of ministry. At least 10%. By the way, uh, sometimes I just feel like saying things uh, because I just believe maybe God puts it on my heart. This was not in my notes. But I actually give my whole salary to Mavuno Church. Um, I don't get paid a salary. I actually donate the whole amount. Why? Because I've come to understand that you can never outgive God. You can't. And for me, because I started with a tithe and then I began to grow in grace and understanding, I began to realize, my goodness, God is my provider. He's actually able to provide far above anything I can even hope or imagine. And I believe that this is going to be your testimony as well. So I want to challenge you. Challenge number four, begin to tithe. And by the way, don't wait until you're out of debt to start tithing. Start now. Uh, make this your commitment. Uh, I know there are people in this church who actually even just do it from the bank. As soon as your salary hits the bank, you have a standing order. And you're like, it's done. It goes to church. I don't even think about it. And you know what? That's my way of saying me and the Devara, we're not friends. Uh, there is no Devara in my house because I believe I walk in the place where the curse of, of the Devara is broken. And so I want to just pray for us right now. I believe that God wants to bless us. And here's what I even want to do. I want us to do a freedom prayer together. But our freedom prayer this week is going to be an interesting prayer. It's a prayer that we've prayed at Mavuno many times. We call it the fearless creed. And the fearless creed talks about being bold 
in our ministry, being bold in following Jesus, being bold in our giving. And I want us to conclude this series by saying the Fearless Creed together. Are you guys ready? Yes, sir. Yes. All right, let's do this. Okay, wherever you are, we're going to say this together. Let's go. I am a fearless influencer. My past is forgiven. My future is secure. My present is not for me, but for the one who set me free. The die has been cast. I have stepped over the line. No more prayerless living, cheap giving, and selfish dreaming. I am fully surrendered to God and to following the vision of this house. I will gladly pay the cost, contagiously spreading His love, playing my role in the Mavuno family to make disciples everywhere until the whole world is changed and every sector of society. I align myself to God's purpose. I will be who He calls me to be. I surrender to be shaped and molded through His Word and through His family until my will and His will are completely aligned and I become everything that God created me to be. Let's say it together. I am a fearless influencer. Somebody give glory to God. Woo! We bless you, Lord. Amen. Amen.